Father, we want you to see Jesus in us for the great work for this time is to reflect the image of Jesus fully. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say happy Sabbath. You know when the sun set, this evening we enter sacred time, amen? amen. And I believe that the great object of the Sabbath is to bring us into an experience with Jesus. You know, the prophet Ezekiel said, that the Sabbaths were set aside to sanctify us and so that we can know that he was God. Amen? Every divine institution is designed to bring us into an experience where we know Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, as we've been studying from night after night, we have proved now that we're in a very critical time. And the only thing that can prevent us from being saved is if we don't come to Jesus. And Satan is in the business of creating things to separate us from Christ. But oh, my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says in Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs chapter 1, we want to notice this before we stop and pray together. In the book of Proverbs chapter 1, notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, that the great longing on the heart of God is to save us? Did you know that? God wants to save us. And brothers and sisters, the only reason why we would not be saved is because of what we find in Proverbs, the first chapter, beginning in verses 22. You're there, Amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. Verse 24. Because I have what? I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. We get a picture of God not trying to close but opening up his arms, not pushing us away, but calling us to him. But the Bible says that we're lost is because we refuse that. And the next verse says, in verse 25, it says, But ye have set at not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as a desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me how, but they shall not find me. Why, Jesus? For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. Therefore, because we said, I don't care what God said. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way. And be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Oh, my friends, that's a sad picture of the loss. Not because they could not be saved, but because they would not be saved. Do you know that if we're lost, we will have defeated the powers of the Godhead. All power in heaven and earth will be defeated if we simply do not respond to the appeal of Christ. That is the condition of the lost. But do you know that in one verse, God sums up what can happen if we would be saved. In the last verse, we see a turn of events. The Bible says, but whoso does what? Now that's not turning our ear. That means that we listen. Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet 
from the fear of evil. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we're living in a very evil time. And if we are not willing to listen to Jesus, we should be afraid. Did you know that? Somebody says, oh, don't make people afraid. My friends, if you don't know Jesus, you should be afraid. I don't know how a man could say, they said, oh, you're, you're making people afraid. My friends, listen to me. The dumbest man in the world is the one who thinks he's all right and he does not know Jesus. Fearfulness will surprise the hypocrite. But if we know him, we don't have to be afraid of anything, my friends. Tonight, we're going to study into a subject that is called the image of the beast. And my friends, if ever there was a time when families should come back to Jesus, if ever there was a time when husband and wife, parents and children, young people, that have strayed from the fold, you know some parents come to me sometimes, they say, Pastor, my child has left the faith, they're not interested in God, is there any hope? And I say to them, you know, volume 6 of the testimonies, 400, 401 says that just before the Sunday law passes, that many backsliders are going to come back to the truth. We're in the time when God is going to slide people back. And if it is your desire that you and your family will be ready for this great crisis that is awaiting us, I want to ask that you might reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord together. We want to spend a few moments just asking God to open up our hearts and to make plain the way of righteousness. And after a few moments of quietly praying where we are, I'll close out out loud from up front and we'll get into the message, the image of the beast. Father, thou who made this world in six days and rested on the seventh, that not only rested but blessed it, and not only blessed it but sanctified it and set it aside for a holy use. And I'm so thankful that that blessing that was placed on this day over 6,000 years ago has lost none of its power. That there is still the ability in that day to bring us to Jesus. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless us now. Oh, what mercy thou hast for a sinful man. That even in the most holy place there is a mercy seat. And we can plead for grace to help in time of need. Oh, Father, what love must be in thine heart to know that when you created man and you formed those hands, you knew that those would be the same hands that slapped you in the face. That when you formed that mouth and nostrils and breathed into it the breath of life, that you knew that those same lips would spit in your face. And yet you said, let us make man in our own image. Father, please, don't let anyone in the sound of my voice be lost. Bring us to Jesus. Now and abide with us, Lord, as we get into the message. Remove every distraction. And speak to our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. If we'll turn to the last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation chapter 13, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. Now you know that it is a biblical fact that for literally hundreds and thousands of years, from age to age and from generation to generation, that God has been working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and degradation. And in these last days... Satan is seeking to prevent 
the salvation of even one soul. If Satan had it his way, not one soul would be saved. But oh, my brothers and sisters, God has another way of working. In fact, nothing is more clear in all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that in the last hour that Satan's great object is to develop what the Bible calls in Revelation the image of the beast. Now, the image of the beast, the book of Revelation shows us that everything we know concerning end time events centers around the development and the formation of this image of the beast. When we talk about Sunday laws and the time of trouble and persecution and the coming of Jesus, everything we know concerning the last days is a result of a direct influence that takes place under the development of the image of the beast to understand its formation is vital. If we do not understand it, my friends, we're lost. The image of the beast is going to test every one of us. In fact, we're told in inspiration that this image is going to test us. Let's read that for a moment. Seven Bible Commentary 976, it says, The Lord has shown me how? Clearly, that the image of the beast will be formed when? Before probation closes. For it. What is the it? The image of the beast. For the image of the beast, it is to be what? The great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. That tells us that when the image of the beast is formed, if we are not ready, we're lost, my friends. The development of the image of the beast and the passing of a national Sunday law brings us to the close of human probation for Seventh-day Adventists. Our response to that test will determine whether we're lost or whether we're saved. And my brothers and my sisters, the question tonight is, is that image to the beast almost set up today? In fact, in the book of Revelation 13, we studied about this. We have discovered that what is going to develop the image of the beast is what the Bible calls the two-horn beast. The what? Two Revelation 13, 11. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And I beheld what? Another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had what? Two horns like a lamb. And he spake how? As a dragon. Last night we finished right here. We discovered that this beast, this two-horned beast, is none other than who? The United States of America. We went through the Bible and we noted very clearly that this two-horned beast has been denoted in the prophecy. Now, this was not the first beast of Revelation. The first beast was what we call, the Bible calls, that first leopard-like beast, and that is none other than the, the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church system, we studied that through the Bible. We noticed the development of that power, and we spent some time identifying very clearly from the Bible. Now, if you don't know that from the Bible, my friends, it's high time that you know all the texts. Because listen, when the loud cry is given, and you're going to give the warning over the beast, his image, and his mark. You're not going to be able to go down the street and say, well, now, man, you must not get this mark of the beast, his image, because a church tells me that the man in this world will not look at that. The sheep only hear the voice of Jesus. Is that right? And if you're not presenting this scripture, my friend, God cannot use you in the loud cry. And so this is why we must understand everything we believe based on the words of Jesus. Is that the Christian position? Man should not live by bread alone, but by, that's the Christian position. And so the Bible is clear about that. If you don't know that first beast from the Bible, you better go back and know all the text for yourself and to help somebody else. Amen? Amen. But that second beast, oh, my brothers and sisters, the first beast is not going to heal his own wound. It is going to be the second beast that heals the wound of the papacy. It is going to be the second beast that causes all of the world to wonder after the first beast. How do I know? Verse 12. What does it say? And he exerciseth how much? All the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So who is it that caused the world to worship the first beast? 
Not the first beast, but the second beast. Is that right? That's America. Now, we notice that inspiration gives us, from the Bible, several different characteristics of this power. We notice that the Bible says very clearly that that second beast that comes out of the earth, that this is America, we notice the identifying marks. But that second beast, we found that the first, it would arise in 1798. Is that right? Now, where do we get that from, from the Bible? That it would arise in 1798. Where do we get that from, from the Bible? No, we didn't get it from 1260. Now, it may be there, but where do we get it from last night? Amen? Remember verse 10, Revelation 13, 10? Now, you're going to make me want to take off my bell, brothers and sisters. If I had one on, you remember we're studying. Remember, open book test. Your notes are right in front of you. Amen? Now, we didn't talk about the 1260, although it's true. But in Revelation 13, 10, we read something that was a prophecy, one of the last prophecies of the first beast. Look at what it says, Revelation 13, 10. It says, he that what? Leadeth into captivity shall do what? Shall go into captivity. So we said that Rome threw many in prison. Is that right? And so he that leadeth into captivity shall what? shall go into captivity. This is a prophecy. He that leadeth into captivity shall, future prophecy, go into captivity. Question. Rome was putting people in prison through that 1260 years. But when did Rome go into captivity? Now you remember that we noted, as we looked at this, everything we believe, this came actually from a Catholic encyclopedia. This says, the temporal sovereignty of the Pope ended during the French Revolution when the French army what? He that leadeth into captivity, captured, shall do what? Go into captivity. Now let the Roman Catholic Church tell you themselves when it happened. Captured Rome when? The French had demanded that the Pope relinquish his temporal sovereignty and withdraw all of his edicts against the revolution since 1791, but he refused. Because of this, the French had dethroned, exiled, and imprisoned him. And in 1798, verse 10 was fulfilled. He that leadeth into captivity shall, shall go into captivity. And so verse 10 brings us to 1798. And at that very time, we see now another beast rising up out of the earth. Does it make sense? And so this would be a nation rising in 1798. We notice that. That this will be a nation rising in 1798. Out of the earth, we represent it, re recognize that that symbolized an area not heavily populated. We looked at the text. We noticed that that could not be in the old world. It had to be in the new world, in the western continent. We noticed that it said that it would even have profession or characteristics of a Christian nation. What was it about that beast that let us know that it would have a profession of Christianity? It would have two horns like a lamb. Now, what does a lamb represent? You remember John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And so this nation, the horns represent the controlling power of a nation. When a horn has crowns, it's a king that controls the nations. But when the horns do not have crowns, it is the power that controls the nation. And the two powers that control America is the foundation of Protestantism and Republicanism. That is the leading controlling powers of America representing those two horns. Representing the character of Christ who said, let Caesar have what is Caesar and let God have what is God. That was Christ's words. This was a Christian principle to have a separation of church and state. And so these two horns, like a lamb, denoted the separation of church and state brought about by Protestantism and Republicanism. Why? Because when those... Pilgrims left Europe. They wanted to get away from a nation that was controlled by a king and by monarchs. And so they said, we want to find a republic. Is that right? This is history. And they said that they want to get it away from all of the oppression of the pope and the church and the fire and the stake. So they said, we want a church without a pope. And that's Protestantism. And as a result of the establishment of America, we see this. But then, my friends, we said that even the Bible tells the form of government, that it would be a republic government. And then we said that though America would rise that way in 1798, and only one nation meets all those specifications, it's unmistakably America. But the Bible says that America would not always remain mild and peaceful. Is that right? 
it said that there will be a great change. You ever heard that word change? That there will be a great transformation. That that lamb-like beast would transform and change and begin to speak as a dragon. Now, what is a dragon? You remember we studied that. What is the nature of a dragon? What does it mean for America to speak as a dragon? What is the nature of a dragon? Now, don't tell me what you told me yesterday. Is that right? Yesterday you told me that a dragon speaks with fire. And I asked for a text you had none. Is that right? What is the nature of a dragon? Now you have a text now, don't you? What is, it, what is the text? Revelation 12, 13. Let's read it. The Bible says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he did what? He persecuted. So the dragon is a persecuting power. Is that right? So when America speaks as a dragon, America becomes a persecuting power. But who is the dragon persecute? Verse 17. Verse 17. What does it say? Revelation 12, 17. It says, And the dragon was wrong with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which does what? Which keep the commandments of God. Does the Bible say the dragon attacks every woman, every church? No, he attacks the church that does what? Keep the commandments of God. So when America speaks as a dragon, she will begin to persecute those who keep the commandments of God. And so for America to speak as a dragon, persecuting those who could keep the commandments of God, my brothers and sisters, you would have to do something to the Constitution in order to do that. Because that law deals with both our relationship to God and our relationship to man. Is that right? It deals with both civil uh, duties and religious duties. And so in order to have a Sunday law, in order to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, there must be a union of church and state. Do you see? And so my brothers and my sisters, the Constitution must be repudiated if you believe the Bible. Every principle must be thrown down in order for this persecution to begin. And my friends, listen, when that persecution starts, unless we look just like Jesus, we'll never be ready. Do you understand this? That when we put on that board that there was a great work and a little time, the little time for seven day Adventists takes us down to the Sunday law. That is the last act in the drama and the great work. What is that great work? Now, come on now. What is the great work? To look just like Jesus. Now, we found out what he looked like. What did Jesus look like? What do we look at in the Bible? 1 Peter 2.21. What did he look like? He did no sin. So if God is going to make us look just like Jesus, and Jesus left us an example that we should follow his steps who did no sin, then in order for a sinner to look just like Jesus, he must bring us to the point where we do no sin. And we said the only hope that we have for that to happen is that Christ must be in us, the hope of glory. So that tells us that by the passing of a national Sunday law, that Christ must be not partially in us, but Christ must be completely in us. You see, brothers and sisters, you and I are like sponges. Like what? You take a sponge... And you put it in grape juice, you squeeze it, what comes out? Grape juice. You take a sponge and you put it in orange, orange juice and you squeeze it, what comes out? You take that same sponge and you put it in water, you squeeze it, what comes out? Water. You and I are like sponges. The Sunday law and its persecution is the squeeze. And if Christ is not in us, Christ cannot come out of us. And so my brothers and my sisters, before the passing of a Sunday law, if Christ is going to come out of us, first he must be in us. Now do you know that when you're in the road like here in California, when people cut you off, and all of a sudden something comes out that Jesus would not think or say or do, it just shows us that Christ is not in us. You know sometimes the devil comes out of us more than Jesus. When husband touches wife and wife husband, parents with their children, young people crossed by another, it demonstrates that Christ is not in us. You know, inspiration says that if Christ were in us, that we could not speak an angry word. That's what inspiration says. 
That the moment we speak an angry word, Christ has left out of our hearts. And let me tell you something. If you're watching what comes from Hollywood, Jesus has to get out of your heart and leave your home. Did you know that? Do you know that Jesus, he will not leave a man and abandon him to death, but Jesus will come and knock at the door of our hearts, and he will come in if we let him. But my friends, when we go to that television and cut on Desperate Housewives, no, it's more serious than that. It's more serious than that. When we cut on Desperate Housewives, you know what Jesus does? Jesus gets up, leaves our house, goes to the door, and begins to knock and say, anytime you want me to come back in, I'll come back in. When we put our ears and listen to the filth of this world, whether we call it gospel or not, when we do this, it makes Jesus have to leave us, friends. And he will stand there knocking, but my friends, Jesus knocking at the door of our hearts will never save us. In order for Jesus to save us, we must open the door and let him in. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be saved. Because they never let him in. They never open up the door. They never give him time to develop a relationship. And I told you yesterday, it does not matter whether it's Facebook or 3ABN. Is that right? You see, anything that can keep us from having personal time in prayer and study and witness and developing an experience where we look just like Jesus. And my friends, we don't have long. Because we're told that America, this two-horned beast, is going to develop the image of the beast. In fact, in verse 14, notice what the Bible says. Revelation 13, 14. It says, speaking of the two-horned beast of America, it says in verse 14, would you read it with me? What does it say? And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that what? That they should make a what? An image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and what? And so it's the two-horned beast, America, that forms an image to the beast. Now watch the point. America is not the image of the beast. Did you hear what I said? America is not the image of the beast. America is going to form an image of the beast. Are you with me? 1798, America was not an image of the beast. But there's going to be a development in America that influences America to change its structure and to imitate the beast, to form an image to the beast, or oh, we'll understand it as we study it tonight. But my point is this. Before the image of the beast can be passed, before the Sunday law will be enforced, America had to become the sole remaining superpower. Are you with me? Now, we discovered that if there is going to be a Sunday law, that very law itself will form or complete the formation of the image of the beast. Do you understand that? Now, notice, when we speak of Sunday worship, does that originate from the state or from the church? Sunday worship originates from a church. Is that right? It's a part of a religion. And Congress says that they shall make and there's no, no establishment of a law that respects any religion. Now, so Sunday worship comes from church, but when I deal with a national law, that does not originate from a church. National laws originate from what? From governments or states. Are you with me? So the very act of having a Sunday law would make a union of church and state. Now, my brothers and my sisters, before this Sunday law will ever be passed and this image of the beast develop, the Bible teaches that America must be the world's sole remaining superpower, and that did not happen until 1990. Are you with me? Now, I told you yesterday that the Sunday law could not have been passed before 1990. Now, when I say that, and I go from place to place, many always say, who are thinking of some quotation, they say, well, well what do you mean, Pastor? Uh, what about those quotations that surround the third angel's message in 1888 where Sister Wright wrote that Jesus could have come what? Er, along this? That Jesus could have come long before now. How do you reconcile that with the statement you made? Well, I reconcile it very easy. I let the Bible explain itself. Amen? 
One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Now, my friends, the answer is this. While we could hasten the coming of the Lord, we would not change the events, would we? And what came first, Revelation or 1888? Revelation. 2,000 years before this movement came into existence in 1844, moving through 63 and down on, this book of Revelation was written. And had we accepted the third angel's message and walked unitedly in its light that led to righteousness by faith, had we accepted it, it would have hastened these events, but it would not have changed them. Are you following me? So when I say that the Sunday law could not have been passed before 1990, I do not mean because of a time. I mean because the Bible says that there has to be America becoming a superpower before, and historically that did not happen until 1990. Are you with me? Now where in the Bible did the Bible say that America would have to be the superpower before the Sunday law is passed? Where is that in the Bible? I'm testing you, Amen. Making sure that you've been looking at your notes and that you've been studying. Where does it say that at? Now you're taking too long. Now we're in Revelation, amen? Revelation 13, let's go back. Revelation 13. Revelation 13 verse 12, speaking of the two armed beasts, it says, And he does what? Exercise of all the power of the first beast before him. He exercised how much of the power? All the power of the first beast before him and cause of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose daily wound was healed. That means he exercised all of the power of the first beast. Is that right? Where did the first beast get his power? Verse 2. What did it say? And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. And his feet was as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power his seat and great authority is that right now let's notice what type of power this is verse 7 what does it say in verse 7 and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to do what overcome them and what power now watch make sure you see it from the bible and power this is the first beast Power was given him what? So power was given him not under, but what? Over. Over what? All. How much? All kindreds. What else? And tongues. And what else? So this was power over how many nations? So the first beast had power over how much of the nations? And the second beast exercised of all of the power of the first beast. Is that right? Now watch. Now, when I look at prefixes, which is the, what is that, the, the, the part of the word before the main root of the word, if I'm dealing with under, what is the prefix for under? Sub. You have a submarine. Marine water, sub, underwater. Are you following me? What is the prefix for over? Super. Is that right? I said sub yesterday, but Super. Super, is that right? So if the Bible says that it will be power over, over how much of the nations? So this would be a what type of power? A superpower. If it's over all the nations, would it be a superpower or the world's the superpower? Are you following me? If that was the first beast... And the Bible says that America would exercise all of that power and then it would cause the world to worship the first beast. Then before the world would see a union of church and state, a Sunday law in America, first America would have to have all of the power of the first beast. Does it make sense? Now, if the first beast was a superpower over all nations, it was not a superpower. It was the world superpower then the question is, when did that happen for America? In 1776, was America the superpower? No, no. She just declared her independence. Now watch, because remember, I told you yesterday that some ministers that thought before that said, young man, I used to preach like you. You remember that? I said that they saw UFOs. That there is a difference, respectfully, between a UFO and an IFO. Is that right? UFO is what? 
an identifier. I am for is what? So there are many that saw movements in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, but they were unidentified. They did not find where they were in the prophetic chart. And as a result, they were guessing. But inspiration says in the last hour, God has given us a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we ought not to guess at anything. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. But reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. I'm thankful for the sure word of prophecy. How about you? Amen. And so those before in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they should have never believed that a Sunday law would be passed until first America became the superpower. That didn't happen in 1776, did it? What about World War I? When was World War I? What year? 1914. Was America the world superpower in 1914? What about World War II? When was World War II? Beginning in 1939, moving through the 40s. Now tell me, was America the superpower in World War II? No. You study history, you will see that America did not even want to get into the war. They were isolationists. It wasn't until Hitler almost beat up and on the whole world that America all of a sudden said, we better get in there unless we're in trouble. And do you know, if you study history, oh, history is so wonderful. Now, I used to didn't believe that. Before I understood these prophecies, I hated history. When I saw the beauty of the prophecy, I went back and said, why didn't I listen? But I praise God. One time my wife went into one of these little stores and they had a set of an encyclopedias for five, for $5, a whole set from the 1700s. My wife picked it up and said, my husband would love this. I said, thank you, honey. <laughs> now you can study. My brother and sister, because if you believe the prophecy, everything we believe should be traced on the pages of what? History. Now, so that tells us that um, and now you study history of Germany, Hitler. When America came down to defeat Hitler, a fog came in unbeknownst. If that fog did not come in, they could have never have dropped their paratroopers down and America would have lost the war. God knows how to come in the fog. What do you say? But my brothers and my sisters, listen to me. In the history of nations, in 1939, America was ranked 13th. How much? So there were... 12 other nations above America. It was rising to world prominence among the nations in 1798, but it was not the world power. Now, my brothers and my sisters, what about during the 1960s? Was it the world power? Who was right there racing up against America in the 60s and the 70s and 80s? Do you know that some people believe that the great controversy was wrong because Russia appeared to get ready to take down America? Many Adventists threw away their great controversies. I wonder if you're doing that today. Now, my brothers and my sisters, during the 60s and 70s and 80s, there were many that said, how could this be true? Because America had its tanks and its nuclear weapons, so did Russia. America was going into space, and so was Russia. America was doing this, and so was Russia. And the world was wondering what would ever take place. But something happened in 1989 that fulfilled the course of history. And remember, brothers and sisters, in 1989, something happened. Remember what inspiration says? Listen. It says, link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are when today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold has come in the past until the present time has been traced where? On the pages of history, Education 178. Now, I love this part. And it says, and how much? And we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled. Say the last three words with me. In its order. So everything is going to happen how? So then we need to know, understand the order. Does it make sense? Does the Bible say the same thing? Where in the Bible does it say it? Are you taking too long? You have an open book test. We put the text down. Is that right? We're showing you all the way through that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say the exact same thing. Job 10, is that right? What did it say in Job 10? Verse 22, what did it say? That it says that when there is not any order, the light is as darkness. So in other words, the children of light become children of darkness when they do not see the order of prophetic events. Does it make sense? 
Now, my brothers and my sisters, when we understand its order, it takes place just as inspiration tells us. Now, we're going to find out that today we are right up against this national sin law. We're going to prove that tonight by God's grace. Tonight, I want to bring you down to 2004 and 2005. By God's grace, if, we were, if you were good students, we could have gone to 2008. Amen? But looking at the time, we only get to 2004 tonight. By God's grace, before it's over, we need to get down to 2008. But we need to really get down to where we are when? Today. I was in the uh, hotel we was at. just getting ready to come outside and go on the walk. My wife and I went to the door, and I thought it was interesting. I looked on the door. They had a little chart of the hotel, and it was talking about in case of a fire, it gave you three words. You are here. I said, look at that, wife. I tried to learn in Spanish to say it to you today, but I forgot it now. Anyway, it, it said, you are here. Now, unless we understand where we are today, we cannot understand the prophetic chart. Are you following me? So we have to walk down prophetic events all the way down through history until we get to the present. And then once we get to the present, we'll know what's getting ready to take place. Because I promise you, we are living in the last few months to the last few years of Earth's history, and the greatest thing we can do right now is to come into a place where we look just like Jesus. Oh, we have to know him, my friends. And all the talking about Jesus will not take the place of knowing him, my friends. And if the most of our time is spending the things of this world here and there, and we only are spending five and ten minutes in prayer and study, do you think we know Jesus? All the preaching of Jesus in the world will not make us know Jesus. Because I can preach the truth to others, but if I don't keep under my body... And bring myself into subjection while I preach the truth to others. I myself could be a castaway. I need him here. And my brothers and my sisters, this is why it's so important that we understand this. Now, we're told that if we understand the order, we don't have to guess. Is that right? Because this says, we have a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey. And we what? Ought not to guess at Great Controversy 598. Now, my brothers and my sisters, as we notice that, when in history, as we trace down the earth order, did America become the world superpower? Let's let history tell us. This comes from the encyclopedia. It says the United States and what? Soviet, Soviet Union were the two what? Superpower. During the Cold War. Was it ready to pass the Sunday law then? Because America had to be what? Not one of the superpowers, but it was to be over all the nations, the superpower. Now, the Bible told us that history is saying the exact same words as the Bible says. Now, this says two superpowers during the Cold War. Here, Ronald Reagan and Michael Gorbachev meet in 1985. Then it says after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the U.S. was left what? As the sole world superpower. So as we trace down the page of history, it wasn't until Russia, Soviet Union broke up and fell that America became what? Now it could exercise all of the power of the first beast. Does it make sense? Now it can speak as a dragon. Now it can force the world because, listen, if America was not the world power, how could it force the world not to buy or sell or force the world to go on church on Sunday unless it had the power to control the nations? Does it make sense? And my brothers and sisters, when did that happen? Front cover, Newsweek 1989, changing the course of everything we believe should be traced on the pages of history. Time Magazine, front cover, talking about how Reagan and the Pope came together. They call it a holy alliance to hasten the demise of communism. Oh, if we had time, we can make this plain. But I'll tell you this, it's clear that that took place in 1989. So that meant that if that happened in 1989, that in 1990, then who was the only world superpower? So the Sunday law could not have been passed before that event. And when we look through history, that event did not happen in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It did not happen until 1990. It was then that we were to look for the Sunday law. Are you with me? But since 1990, my friends. Now, this is tough front cover. You know what that face is? You remember that face? Who is that? Was he in the office at what time? He was getting ready to go in the office. Was it before the 90s or after the 90s? So that tells us now, and I know it's what they ask. Has America become what? 
not a national ability, but a what? Now, what does that mean? That it has the whole world in his hand. This is, oh, my brother and sister, the whole world in his hand. Now, do you notice what that is right there? Now, who wears capes? Superheroes. In other words, it's saying that it is a superpower of the world. Are you following me? So it has been fulfilled just as the Bible says everything has happened. Jesus said, I tell you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. This happened by 1990. Everything is happening as it says in its order. Is that right? Now we have to keep following now. After 1990, now do you know that since 1990 that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy tell us that there are only six. How many? That there are only six great events with 1990 that will actually lead to the image of the beast and to the passion of the Sunday law. Not 20, but six. How many? And do you know that in 2008, we reached number five? In 2008, we reached number five. And after number five comes number six, and number six is going to bring about the development of the image of the beast. Number six is going to bring the Sunday law. And if number five started in 2008, how close are we to number six now? Inspiration said, what others have been learning for years, we will have to learn in a few months. That we have a great work and but a not short time. Say what inspiration says. And but a little time in which to do it. Now that is a short time. I say it like it says it. Amen. And but a little time in which to do it. Now, after the 1990s, we begin to start seeing the Pope like never before call for Sunday to be sanctified. This was in 1998. After the 90s now, we see this happening. We don't have time. Now, this was in 2004. This came from the Huntsville Times, 2004, July 18. It says, what did it say? Why is it what? Sunday special anymore. So in other words, it said there was a time when Sunday was special. And what we need to do is do what? Go back and make it special again. In other words, we need Sunday worship again. Now, my friends, what happened to make all over the world, if you start looking through, you'll begin to see that after the 90s, into the 2000s, man began to scream for Sunday loss. What happened to make men want these Sunday laws? Because my brothers and sisters, very soon a change is coming. You know who that man is? Tomorrow, you will understand what is getting ready to take place with these two men. When we say tomorrow, oh, brothers and sisters, we're going to make it plain by God's grace. And we're going to see exactly what this means. But we can't go today. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But my point is, that is going to show us that the Sunday law is coming. They look a little bit too happy together. What do you say? <laughs> and can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now, my brothers and my sisters. Inspiration told us that these two powers would come together. Is that right? Now, do you know that when you look historically at 1776, no American would have ever thought that this would happen? You know that, right? Why did those pilgrims leave England to come to America anyway? To get away from this. Is that right? They wanted to get away from the kings, and so they had a republic, get away from the popes and the persecution, and so they wanted Protestantism. What in the world would make this happen? Now, the Bible told us it would happen. There was a change. Now, something happened in the 1990s down through 1999 to make this change. Now, we don't have the time tonight and tomorrow to go through all these points. We said six points. I'm not going to have the time to go through all the nights. It's so important, tonight and tomorrow. But we will have DVDs and CDs available where you can study through it all. I want to go through points three and four because they bear us very specifically on what happens here and what happens in 2008 and what happens in 2004 and five, And they mean so much to us. So I'm only going to deal with three and four. One and two is what made the world begin to want Sunday laws in the 90s. But my brothers and my sisters, first thing is, does the Bible say that America and Rome were joined together? Where in the Bible? Well, we're reading, is that right? Revelation 13, 11, and 12, it says that the second beast of America would exercise all the power and would cause the world to worship the first beast, meaning that America and Rome would begin working how? Yes. Now, do you know that if the Pope had come to America before the 1960s, he would have been stoned? Did you know that? 
Did you know that? The, America, the, the, the Pope was not welcome in America before the 1960s. Neither was America welcomed by the papacy. Did you know that? Now this is in 1989, now, in this article. Now this article, I'm going to blow it up. This, is actually, this article actually came out. This is the Time Magazine of April 14, 2008. This says the papal diplomacy wants Chile. You know what it means, Chile cold. There was a separation. You follow. It says the U.S.-Vatican relations have grown steadily warmer over what? The past 50 years. Now, if you could read that, you can't see it too clearly, but it said the American heresy, the U.S. church is still, and it's beginning to talk about the Pope here, called that American church a heresy way back here, and you go back to this time, and this was just before the 1960s, that the Pope, the American church was called a heresy, and that didn't change until America was only welcome after Vatican II in the 1960s. Then after this, in 1995, of the Pope, for the first time, appears on the front cover of Time magazine as the man of the year. How can you move from being stoned in the 60s to become the man of the year in 1995? Something has happened. Is that right? We don't have time to talk about it, but one and two of these prophetic events tell us what happened. But now, my brothers and my sisters, do you know what the biggest issue was in the 1960s when John F. Kennedy became president? How many remember when John F. Kennedy became president? You know what the biggest issue was? How in the world could America have a Catholic president? That was the first Catholic president in 1964. It was so significant that John F. Kennedy had to get on public address on the television and actually had to say on the public address, though I am a Roman Catholic, I will not let it control the way I run my presidency. Interesting enough that he died, but that's another story. Is that right? But the point is that that was the case in the 1960s. So strange, but now you can have a Catholic president and nobody even thinks about it. Something has happened. Is that right? Now I want you to notice something. This article came out. If you could see that, you see what year that is? 1995. This says Christian Co Coalition wants what? Catholic support. Now I want you to notice something now. I'm coming to this image of the beast. I'm coming to the heart of our study. Now my brothers and my sisters, as we notice this, there has to be in order to have uh, this statement of Revelation 13 true, there has to be before the Sunday law passes a coming together of Rome and America before the Sunday law passes. Is that right? Now, in 1995, notice what this says. The Christian want the Catholic support. I wonder if they have it. Let's see. What, I'm, I'm blowing up this article. What did it say? The idea that there can be some kind of what? Of alliance. Now, what year is this? 1995. The idea that there can be some kind of alliance between the Christian coalition and the Roman Catholic Church is nonsense. What is that saying? They say there's no way that Rome and, and, and the Catholic and evangelicals and Americans can work together. They said it's nonsense. What year? What does the Bible say? Are they going to do it or not? Question. Are they working together right now? Everything we believe should be traced on the pages of? Now, I blew that up and you can see that that actually says the Sacramento Bee. I actually got this in 1999. I was here in, Calif I was in, in Sacramento, California in 1999, and I took this article. We got this article. Now, in 1999, I want you to see what this says. Catholics, Lutherans finally reach what? Agreement. An agreement on salvation. This is 1999. I'm going to blow this up so you can see it. Now, watch. The great what? 482-year dispute between Catholics and Protestants is what? About 10. Now, this is 1999. Are you with me? 1995, nonsense. 1999, it's about to what? About to end. Now, watch. What does it mean that it's about to end in 1999? Oh, we were preaching about this in 1999. This is getting ready to happen. What did it mean that it was about to end? I want you to understand this now. Last day events, page 130. What did it say? Protestantism, evangelicals shall give the hand of fellowship to what? 
In other words, Rome and the Protestant churches are going to do what? So it says, they're going to give the hand to the Roman power. After they do this, what's going to happen? Then there will be a what? A law against the Sabbath of God's creation. What kind of law is that? A Sunday law. So first Rome and the evangelical Protestants will join, then a Sunday law. Are you with me? So once they join in fellowship, then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. Now that tells me then that if this says that it was about to end Protestants and Catholics, what that is really saying is that a Sunday law in 1989 was about to be passed. Do you understand that? All right. Now my question is, what about today? What does that say? Catholic bishops do what? Join the Christian Alliance. 1995, nonsense. 1999, we're getting ready to come together. 2004, we're united. Watch. It says, the nation's Roman Catholic, November 17, 2004, the nation's Roman Catholic bishops voted Wednesday to join a what? So this has never happened before. Are you with me? Didn't happen in the 30s, didn't happen in the 40s, didn't happen in the 50s, 60s, 70s. That were UFOs. This is IFOs right now. This is a new alliance that will be the broadest Christian group ever formed. Where? In the United States, linking, that's joining together, linking American what? What's another word for evangelicals? Protestants. Lincoln Evangel Evangelical Protestants and what? Catholics and an ecumenical organization for the? Has this ever happened before? So in 2004, this is the first time, but the Bible told us over 2,000 years ago that Rome and America will join forces. Then we would have a Sunday law. And so in 2004, this had to happen before Sunday law. Are you with me? Number three of the, uh, of the prophecy, let me erase this here. Number three is that Protestants and Catholics must unite before the Sunday law. Question, had they united? What year? 2004. Number four. Let's read that together. Great Controversy, page 445. It says, when the what? Leading churches. Leading churches of the United States of what states? That's not the other countries, that's in America, is that right? Uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall do what? Shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed a what? Image of the Roman hierarchy or an image of the beast. And the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably resolve. Great Controversy 445. That tells us that before the Sunday law, the image of the beast, that not only must Protestants and Catholics unite, but the leading what? The leading what type of churches? The leading Protestant churches must do what? The leading, what is the word used? The leading Protestant churches must do what? Unite. Is that right? So the leading Protestant churches must unite. Question, when are they going to unite? Now, this is great controversy. This is great controversy. Page 445. Question, is that in the Bible? That the leading churches must unite before the image of the beast, before the Sunday law. Is that in the Bible? Or do you believe the Bible says something different than the spirit of prophecy? Now, I wonder where that is in the Bible. Look at what it says. Revelation 13. Let's see it in the Bible. Revelation 13, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 11, talking about America, this beast will come up out of the earth, having horns like a lamb and speak as a dragon. Verse 12 says, and he exercised of all the power of the first beast before him and caused of the earth and then which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose daily wound was healed. Now read verse 14 with me. And deceive of them that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Of those miracles which it had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now watch what America is going to do. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that what? They should make a what? An image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. That means that if this is the beast, then America is going to form a what? 
image to the beast. And verse 15 says, of the beast. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is an image? A likeness, a reflection. I go to a mirror, and I go into the mirror, and I look into it. If I look into the mirror, I see an image not of another man. If I'm looking into a mirror, I see the image of what? Myself. And so if I say the beast and his image, that means that whatever the beast looks like, in the structure of its power, that the image of the beast would have to look just like it. Are you with me? So in order to know how America will form an image to the beast, we need to know what the beast looks like. Does that make sense? Now, there are two main things of the beast that America is going to use to form an image of the beast, and it's right here in this quotation, and it's in the Bible. What does it say in this quotation? Two things. In order to form an image of the beast, I want you to study. Look at the quotation. The answer, open book. Two things to make an image of the beast. What is it? What is it? A uniting of what? Of the leading churches. Is that right? The uniting of the leading churches. What else? Once they come together, what are they going to do? What do they say? Shall influence the state to sustain. In other words, there will be support from the state. In other words, there would be a union of... So the two things that are going to make the image of the beast, union of church and state. There must be a uniting of the leading churches, and there must be a union of church and state. This is necessary to form an image of the beast. Is that right? Now let's watch that in the Bible. That was great controversy. Look in the Bible now. Now, the Bible says there will be an image of the beast. Now, question, who is the beast? Roman Catholic church system. Many Christians in that church. But the system is of the enemy, my friends. Now, what does the word Catholic mean? It means what? Universal. Is that right? Now, my brothers and my sisters, think about it now. It means universal. What is the prefix for universal? Uni. You have a bicycle. What does bicycle mean? Two. If I have a unicycle, what is a unicycle? So uni means one, Catholic church means universal church, it means one church. There was a one world church back here. And the image of the beast means that the Protestant churches in America that have over 101 different denominations, if they're going to form an image of the beast, there must be a uniting, a uni. Are you following me? The separate churches... Baptist, Episcopalian, and Presbyterian, all the rest, Pentecostal, Church of Christ, there must be an ecumenical movement to unite these churches. Do we see it today? That's necessary in order to get an image of the beast. Is that right? So we see here that the Bible says in order to have an image of the beast, there must be a uni church, there must be a uniting. And America must have their churches unite into one church. Are you following me? But now we said here, number two, it must be a union of church and state. Is that in the Bible? What about the beast? Is the beast a union of church and state? Look at Revelation 13, verse 7. Revelation 13, 7 says, And power was given unto him to do what? To make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over what? All kindreds and tongues and nations. The power that rules over nations is not church power. It is what type of power? Civil power. So in Revelation 13, 7, it shows that the beast was a civil power. Is that right? So is the beast a civil power? Yes. Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church is the only church that has an ambassador? Did you know that? Do you know why? Only civil powers, nations, have ambassadors. Every nation has an ambassador, but only one church has an ambassador. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church is not only a religious power, it is a civil power. And the power that rules over nations is civil power. So in the papacy, in the beast, there is a civil power. What about a religious power? Verse 8, Revelation 13, 8. What does it say? And all that dwell upon the earth shall do what? Shall worship him. Now, I didn't make it up. Now, civil powers are not worship. What type of powers are worship? Religious power, is that right? So in the beast, 
It is both a civil power and a religious power. Do you see that in the Bible? So in order to have an image of the beast, then America must not only unite its Protestant churches, but in order to have an image of the beast, church in state and America must unite just as it was in the beast. Does it make sense? So we see that from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, they say the same thing. Same thing. These two things must take place. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and my sisters, my question is, has this one happened yet? Because before they will influence the state, the leading churches must come together to have one power to influence the state. Are you with me? Everything we believe traced on the pages of history. What does it say? Protestants do what? Move toward affiliation despite what? Now, this is the early 90s, moving into the, the late 90s. Watch. This actually came out January, you can't see it here, January 2003. It says, leaders propose what? Christian Alliance. Let's blow it up a little bit. It says, church leaders from 30 denominations agreed Wednesday on a proposal to create the broadest alliance of Christians ever formed where? What year is this? 2003. I wonder what was happening. You go through and you see one and two of, this, of the six events, you'll know what's happening. But my brothers and my sisters, this happened. They actually said, we'll blow it up a little bit more. This actually said, what are they going to come together for? It says the proposal being sent, churches says that in the earliest stages, the alliance will exist mostly for what? What this person says, they will unite upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common. The exact wording has been given to us in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. And it's amazing that some won't believe the Spirit of Prophecy. And this says, it says they will exist for commonalities and differences. Later it will become more active in doing what? Speaking to society. I wonder if the Bible says it will speak. The Bible says they had two horns like a lamb, but it's going to speak as a dragon. The very words are used, my friends. God is telling us this that we might understand. This is 2003. We saw the majority of Christian churches come together in 2003, but in this, you'll notice that the Catholic Church did not join this in 2003. Did you hear me? The Catholic Church did not join until what year? 2004. And not only the Catholic Church, but then we find out that the Pentecostal Church did not join. I wonder why that's important. We'll see in a moment. Because inspiration says that before the image of the beast, it says how much of the churches? The leading. Didn't say all the churches. That's not what the quotation says. That's not add or take away. Look at what the quotation says. When the what? Now in 2003, almost every leading church joined except for two. The Christian, uh, the, the, I should say the Catholic church, which they don't consider a Christian church, but uh, of the Protestant churches rather. But there was one more that did not join. And that was the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, this article we just looked at showed us that in 2004, when the Roman Catholics and the Evangelicals joined together, that the image of the beast was almost formed. Is that right? But I'm blown up this article. In 2004, this same article said, the Catholic Church has an ongoing ecumenical dialogue with many denominations. However, some evangelical and Pentecostal churches have resisted participating. In the floor debate Wednesday, New York Cardinal Edward Egan noted those churches were worried that such talks risk what? Now it's amazing that they did not want to join because they said if we join the ecumenical oral movements, it would water down our messages. Have the children of the world become wiser than the children of light? Because my brothers and my sisters, we as a people have entered into these ecumenical organizations. And it has resulted, and now the once symbol that was held out as the threefold message has been taken down, and an ecumenical symbol has been introduced in this place. And if we don't understand this, we don't understand why. Tomorrow you'll understand completely why. But my brothers and my sisters, this tells us that they did not join. In fact, it says the evangelical what? Now, brothers and sisters, you ever been to a class, you had a good teacher, and they were giving you a test, they would say, write this down because it's going to be on the test. Write down Southern Baptist Convention because it's going to be on the test, my friends. Now, listen. It says, 
the Evangelical Southern Baptist Convention, which has more than what? 16 million members and is what? The what? The largest Protestant denomination. So, now watch what it says. In the country, that's America, has so far not what? To fully join Christian churches together. Now, this Christian Church Together is the organization from 2003 that had all the rest of the churches together. The Baptist Convention did not join, Catholics did not join, but in 2004, the Catholic Church joined this union. But the Southern Baptist Convention still, in 2004, did not join, and the Southern Baptist Convention is the leading Protestant churches. Are you with me? Now, I was drawing meetings like this all down during that time, and I remember seeing this article, and I knew that when Catholics and Protestants come together, the inspiration says, then there'll be a Sunday law, and I begin to start praying, saying, Lord, something's not happening, right? The chart says that a Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. Everything is ready, but I know that the leading Protestant churches must unite. But in 2004, the Southern Baptist Convention did not unite. I said, what's going on, Lord? The Lord said, watch, watch. And I began to pray and study, going to place to place, talking about these things, telling what's going to happen. But my brothers and sisters, I was coming from a meeting just like this. And I'll say this before I look at that. That's why in 2004, we have this call for Sunday. You see that? Just when that joined together, we see this call, this push for Sunday. But now, my brothers and my sisters, we see now in 2004, the image of the beast is almost formed. What it needs is this influence of the state. The Southern Baptist Convention did not join. But on that Sunday when I was finished doing the meeting, I saw this on the front cover. I was in Tennessee doing the meeting. This is August 15. And if you can read that, I, I wrote down 2005. What year? What is it called? How many have ever heard of Justice Sunday? Let me see you hold, hold up your hand. You've never heard of Justice Sunday? Are you serious? Do you understand that this is a direct fulfillment of the prophecy that shows that the son-in-law is about to be passed and we have not even heard of it? Do you think we're ready? To not know these things is fatal, my friends. And I don't care what we're preaching, where we're going, what we're doing. If we don't know this, we're going to be lost. We have a great work and but a little time. Do you know that when this son in laws passed, that old and young are going to wake up? That a church, everybody's going to wake up and say, it's serious? People will say, I don't care about God. People will be, who are more interested in, in doing what the world wants than knowing what God wants, young people that are more excited with the world, are going to wake up at that time and say, oh, I want to get to know Jesus. But it's going to be too late then. When he had his wild, wild arms open wide, you refused. He says, then he's going to withdraw himself. Oh, my friends, do you understand what this means? When I saw this, I, I picked up this article, and the Holy Spirit, my prophetic antenna went off, if you can say that word. And the Holy Spirit said, buy that newspaper. I got the newspaper, and I went into the house. And as I went into the house, uh, rather into my vehicle, I didn't have a GPS at the time, not an electronic one, but my wife was my GPS. Amen. <laughs> she was on the side. I gave her the map. I marked out the road and said, now, honey, where are we on the next position? And now she was there on the side, and I gave her this article, and I said, I want you to read it to me as I'm driving. Because something prophetic is happening. And all of a sudden, as she's reading to me, she reads just this Sunday, and it says, who holds the power? People hold the power. Now remember, that in order to form an image of the beast, they are going to form an image of the beast. The power rests with the people. Now my brothers and my sisters, I blow it up in the part of the article I start reading, my wife begins to read this, it says, people urge to do what? Affect change Where? In the judicial system. In other words, it is going to be the people that affect change so that laws can be forced. In order to have an image of the beast and a Sunday law, the people must be influenced to cause church and state to do what in America? To unite. But all oh, my brothers and sisters, all oh, this is scared. Do you know who this man is right here? You can barely see him there. 
Yeah, that's James Dobson right there. That's a dangerous fellow, my friends. And my brothers and my sisters, he was there all the first day. Preachers were there all talking about coming together in an ecumenical organization. For the first time, they were saying, let's join together and let's urge the people to enforce judicial laws to bring back morality. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I'm going to blow it up. It says, they feel very deeply about the nation. We love God. Bishop Harry Jackson, Jr., a Maryland pastor and author, spoke about the next sense of the, of the new sense of the black church to team with the what? White evangelical church. You know, that doesn't even make sense to have a black church and a white church. <laughs> and while that's over there in Babylon, do you know that that has creeped into the remnant church? To have a black church and a white church? You think in heaven there's going to be a black church and a white church and a Spanish church and a Chinese church and an Asian church? And a, do you think it's going to be like that? My brothers and sisters, this is foolishness. When God's work is done, that division of separation between nationalities will be thrown down, my friends. Amen. This message will bring about a union of every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, this tells us very clearly. It is talking about this, going back down through this, and it says bringing, uh, bringing this evangelical church and the Catholic church to deal with the moral issue. saying all of us are coming together because the morality is so terrible. Then it says, we, have not, we are not just going to do what? Sit back and let America to go down this ramp of what? Now, if you understand one and two of the prophetic chart, oh, my brothers and sisters, you will say, this is prophetic. You know, we are told in Great Controversy 587 that a Sunday law will be passed to improve the morals of society. Now, in this sense, now is what? The time. This is our time. Call and write our senators. They're trying to affect change. But you know what was the most serious thing? The most serious thing that I saw when I read this was when my wife looked at this. I said, honey, when she read this, I said, honey, would you please read that again? You know what happened? She read this right here. I'm going to blow it up one more time. She read this right here. It says, it's a new day. Liberalism is dead. If you understand Daniel 11, oh, it's, it, this is wonderful. This says, the majority of Americans are what? Conservative. You can count on us for showing up and what? Speaking out. And let the church, let it do what? Let it rise. Now when I saw that, literally hair stood on my head. And I said, honey, did you say what you just said? And I had to read it again. I went back, and this is what I heard. Sutton, first vice president of the Nashville Base Southern Baptist Convention, the nation's largest Protestant body. He closed with these words that just a Sunday. It's a new day. Remember last year I wasn't with you. Liberalism is dead. The majority of Americans are conservative. You can what? Could they count on them last year? You can count on us for showing up. I wonder if they're going to speak as a dragon very soon and speaking out. And let the church rise. My friends, that tells us very clearly that as of 2005, every bleeding Protestant church has united. Not will. It's happened. And all that is necessary now is there to be a union of what? And then it is that promise in America will form the image of the beast. Then it is that a national Sunday law will be passed. And my brothers and sisters, I know from the prophetic word what it is that is going to make the people want a Sunday law. And what it is is number five that began in 2008 that we're going to study tomorrow.
Oh, I wish I could just tell you tonight. You know what it is. You, want me, you know what it is. It is going to be. No, I'm not going to tell you tonight. I don't have enough time. I don't want to open up a can. I can't get to it. But I'll tell you this. Right now today, the majority of, of Americans are not going to any church. Did you know that? They're not going to church on Saturday or Sunday. The majority of Americans can care less. But when this thing that began in 2008 is going to get the attention of the entire nation and is going to make the people demand a Sunday long. That's number five. That started 2008, two years ago. We're in the heart of it. There's only one more thing before the image of the beast is formed and the Sunday law is passed. We are living, as inspiration says, in the last few months to the last few years of Earth's history. And we're told that what others have been learning for years, we shall have to learn in a few months, my friends. Everything is ready but us. And all the talking about getting ready will never get us ready. Did you know that? And the only thing that can prevent us from worshiping the image of the beast is if we have received completely the image of God. Did you know that? You see, everything that God does, Satan has a counterfeit. God has a church, Satan has a church. God has a Sabbath, Satan has a counterfeit Sabbath. God has his image and Satan has his. Satan's image is the image of the beast. But what is God's image? You read the Bible in Hebrews 1, it says Jesus is the express image of God. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to him that is lost. And whom the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ has been hid, who is the image of of God. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the purpose of the gospel is to restore in us the image of God. And unless that image has been completely restored in us, we will worship the image of the beast. Do you look just like Jesus? Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? I was pointing to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have laid embrace this third angel's message. The angel said, get ready, get ready, get ready. My friends, we're not ready. Not one in this room is ready tonight, including me, my friends. And unless we start spending more time with Jesus, unless we start turning our eyes from this world and saying, Lord, I need you to make me just like Jesus. Do you want that tonight? What is more important than that? Well, my brothers and sisters, if that is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me? You know, somebody says, Pastor, how can God help me? Look how terrible my life has been. My friends, I care not how terrible your life has been. The purpose of the gospel is to take a sinner and to make him a saint. The purpose of the gospel is to restore in us the image of God. The purpose of the death of Jesus and his work in the sanctuary is so that he can save us to the uttermost if we come to Jesus. And if we come, he will restore in us his image. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I know that means something different for me. I need you to do something that has never been done in my life before. I want you just to raise your hand where you are. If you know that you don't have a love for God and his truth, but you want it more. You don't have that image yet, but you're saying, Lord, time is too short to play around with thee. But I want something special tonight. Just raise your hand. God sees it. Praise God. I remember years ago, before I heard this message in its clarity, I hated this word of God. I hated the truth of God. I was bored with it. But when God showed me what should it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul, I remember being pressed forcibly with a need to pray, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And I want to pray that for us tonight. Oh, Father, your word is clear, Lord. You have taken us down through prophetic history from eternity in the past. 
to eternity in the future. You've walked down through the ages, down through Babylon, and Medio Persia, Greece, and Rome, and Papal Rome, going off the scene in 1798. We saw the rise of America. We see what was to take place before the Sunday law could be passed and the image of the beast developed. And we see, Lord, that since 1990, only six things before the Sunday law comes. And we entered number five two years ago, Lord. Number six will bring the Sunday law. And it's almost here. And, Lord, we're not ready yet. Lord, we're not ready. Oh, Father, Father, please, Lord. Give thy people just a little more time. Please, Lord. Please, Lord. Show us that many who are going to come in that day and say, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I prophesy and preach and win souls? Didn't I do this and that? And Lord, they're going to hear you say, I never knew you. Lord, don't let us deceive ourselves. I give you my heart tonight. I lift up the hearts of thy, thy people and our families. Lord, may we say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And who knoweth, Lord, that you brought us to this meeting, to this church, for such a time as this. Save us, we pray, through the blood and matchless love of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen.